You're listening to Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Pedro. Verizon suffers a data breach. First look at IOTA and Metal. Darren submits his first poll request. All this and more on episode 214 here on Wednesday, July 12, 2017. In the traditional markets, we have gold down to $1,221. Silver is down to $15.90. Oil is down to $45.46. Since the Dow is down or Dow is up to twenty one thousand five hundred thirty two points, and the thirty year Treasury yield is slightly up to two point eight eight percent. Thanks, Darren. Bitcoin is down to twenty three eighty seven in the crypto markets. Litecoin is down to forty seven forty eight, and Ethereum is down to two nineteen, and Dash is down to one hundred and seventy seven dollars. Now, just a reminder that you can tune in to Cash Radio every Wednesday night. Don't want to miss a single mode of awesome Neocache content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. You can subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, and more. Well, starting off with our top story tonight, the uh, Verizon data breach exposes 14 million subscribers. An Israeli technology firm discovered the records of at least 14 million Verizon customers on an unprotected um, Amazon S3 storage server. The data was recovered in late June and took over a week before it was secured. The records were contained in log files. Now, mind you, this server was open to the public. Anybody who had the address could go to this address, this uh, uh, server address, and they could see whatever was in there. There was no absolutely mm-hmm. no protections whatsoever. The records were contained in log files generated when a Verizon residential customer made a call to customer service. The data contained the customer's name, cell phone number, and their account PIN. It also contained home address, email address, and many more fields. According to an anonymous Verizon call center representative, having these items would allow anyone to access your account. The log files were found in six folders according to the months that the call was placed, so January through June. The article goes on to say Verizon said it was, uh, uh, quote, Verizon said it was investigating how its customer data was improperly stored on the Amazon Web Services server as, quote, part of an authorized and ongoing project, unquote, to improve customer service. The uh, Verizon uh, also, uh, another quote from Verizon, Verizon provided the vendor with certain data to perform this work and authorized the vendor to set up AWS storage as part of this project said the spokesperson. Unfortunately, the vendor's employee incorrectly set their AWS storage to allow external access. And one account from a senior Verizon employee with knowledge of the situation said that the company was unaware that the data was being exfiltrated or exported and that Verizon had no control over the server. This doesn't really bode well for Verizon's data security techniques. Uh, you know, so- I'm a Verizon customer and T- tell tell me again why cell phone companies need to have our personal information. When can we get cell phones on a blockchain without needing to give up all this personal information that can then potentially be stolen and you know used to used to you know go yeah. against you with scams or or stealing? Well, this, you know the problem really is is that the cell phone company wants to merge your your uh, credit card with your your cell phone account so that you can buy things online and through their Play Store through their whatever whatever store and an Apple store, whatever it might be. And so they want that, that seamless integration. You know what I'm saying? So there, there's mm-hmm. no step to you spending your money. So may, maybe this is a good opportunity to start thinking about, you know, I mean, you, <clears throat> you don't need personal information to have a VoIP number, right? I mean, there's all these applications that you can get that you can make phone calls. So I'm looking forward to the day that, you know, cell phone companies don't need to have all that info if, you know, um, the crown yeah. lets them. Right, exactly. Well, yes, that's, that's, it's not only that, but it's, it's almost like there are probably some know your customer sort of standards in place because the, uh, sure, you can go and get a burner phone from, from the store, sure, but it's, it's typically not, uh, you know, it's the functionality really isn't, isn't as great and the convenience isn't there. So if you want the convenience and functionality, you pretty much have to give up your info. What would be cool was if you had a smartphone that just had data and that smartphone didn't have to have identifying information for you to access that data, maybe prepaid cards or some way to replenish minutes on an automated basis with, say, um, you know, blockchain technology. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, Pedro, do you know about a phone that's coming out based on blockchain technology and not, not sharing yet. with us? No, actually, I don't. Okay. Well, well, 
Uh, Darren, we've got some news from yep. you. So uh, Dash gets one step closer to scaling. So last show I announced that uh, there was a new Dash repository. This repository is called Dips and was for Dash improvement proposals or Dips. Nice. Right? And, um, well, this week uh, there is an approved pull request on the repository for Dip 0001, and it outlines how Dash will scale to two blocks. So it's uh, it's a very simple application of what's called BIP9, uh, which is a Bitcoin improvement plan. Okay. And so it's just going to signal through the versions that uh, everybody's upgraded and once enough people upgraded, then it switches over. Nice. So who's the author of this proposal? Well, I did. I made it. Wait, what? I I wrote it. Darren, are you working for Dash? Yes. Oh, okay. (laughs) I I am. That's right. So I, I, you know, I took my math degree and I went and talked to him. I said, hey, guys, you need some math. And I mean, no. and and literally, like they said, okay, just do what you think is helpful, and then, um, so uh, one, I posted on the in their little chat thing. I said, let me know if you need any math, and uh, right away, somebody's like, we need a probability table. So I made a probability table and all kinds of things. So uh, there's all kinds of math to be done for the Dash team. Excellent, it's wonderful. Excellent, there. All right, uh, moving on. We've got Bitcoin skeptic Mark Cuban says he'll gamble on Unicorn ICO. Unicorn? Yeah. So now this is the guy who said Bitcoin is a bubble uh, not long before it went down in value, which I don't think really had anything to do with it. But Unicorn is an esports betting site with a focus on MOBA style video games. MOBA is the uh, the multiplayer online battle arena, basically a five v five team or some something like that. Now they are planning a token launch in September on the public Ethereum blockchain. There really isn't much more on their website about the token or token sale. I would assume that it will be an ERC-20 token. But once again, this space is full of competitors as far as the esports betting goes. But you know what? Maybe the, the other ones didn't get it right, and Unicorn is going to do it. I don't know. Uh, moving on, the Waves platform announces a new partnership. The Waves platform, which bills itself as Russia's biggest blockchain project, announced that it had signa- signed a memorandum on strategic partnership with Deloitte CIS, a regional affiliate of the firm that provides financial and other professional services in over 150 countries. CryptoInsider.com reports that the partnership aims to provide, quote, comprehensive initial coin offering services and customized blockchain solutions tailored for specific business tasks, unquote. Waves and Deloitte CIS also say they will be working together to, quote, develop legal mechanisms for regulating ICO projects, unquote. Well, Regardless of what you think about legal mechanisms and things like that, the fact that Deloitte is partnering with a blockchain is is pretty big, pretty big news there. But yeah, pretty big change in Russia's stance on crypto in the past six months. They I mean, certainly it, have. It wasn't very long ago that they wanted to ban anything crypto, and now they're really embracing it. I mean, recently we had Vladimir Putin meet with uh, Vitalik. That's right. Yeah, if you've listened to Neocash Radio long enough, you know, you've heard us report on the many threats against Bitcoiners from Russia and their central banking uh, regime. So this, you know, I, the Waves platform, I really, what I want to do is uh, d- dedicate some time to really fleshing that out and talking about that on the show. I don't think I've spent enough time on it. I think there is some interesting things going on there, but uh, this will certainly help them elevate their stature as far as I'm concerned. Well, moving on to other news, uh, Metal Rewards Fiat to Crypto Conversions. Uh, So this is a new token that is recently finished. The uh, payment platform Metal recently completed their token launch. The Metal token MTL is an ERC-20 token on the public Ethereum blockchain. The company is coin agnostic, however, and aims to allow users freedom in which assets they would buy or spend. Metal Pay uses something called Proof of Payment Processing for Fiat Payments, through the the payment system, combined with a centralized form of know-your-customer verification, parties at either end of the transaction would receive up to 5% bonus in MTL tokens in their wallet. So, like, if you send $100 and you have all your know-your-customer things set up right, then you and if your sender has his customer things set up, you both would receive basically $5 worth of MTL token. Hmm. So it's it's like the uh, we we talked about the whole loyalty and incentivizing merchants with the Zifter way mm-hmm. back in the day. This is sort of that take, uh, as far as I can see. Now the focus of the project is very clear. They want to incentivize merchants to accept cryptocurrencies while providing a simple and easy to use wallet app. 
The term layman keeps coming up in the white paper, making it clear the targeted audience is not crypto veterans, but rather people who may not even know they're using blockchain technology, nor perhaps care. The token sale uh, created 66,588,888 MTL tokens. Of that amount, only uh, 16 million and a half were sold to the public during the sale. The rest of the tokens were either held in a fund to pay out the incentive for the POPP, or which that 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 fund is 26 million, more than 26 million token, or have been allocated to company operations for payouts and funding and investors, founders, that sort of stuff. For all the egalitarian talk in the white paper, I'm seeing very few token holders currently on Etherscan. Uh, when I looked, it was just barely over 400. The price started out about 122 and has risen over to four dollars in two days, with the amount in circulation being only a third of the total and no actual app that I can tell. This seems very irrational. Naturally, the trading has nothing to do with the actual project or team. I just wanted to point out the ironies between the egalitarian white paper and the... It's not necessarily something against metal, but it's more something against ICOs, is that typically you end up with very few people holding a lot of tokens, and that is not egalitarian by any means. Um, so this is... It's it's interesting to note this. Now, it's got a, it's got investment from Eric Voorhees and a couple other big names, so you've got... Uh, some some momentum behind it but the fact that they're really pushing for fiat to crypto conversions and then incentivizing that i think is pretty much gonna bring a lot more people to the uh the, the crypto you know universe if yeah, you will it could be another avenue to uh you know to, to make crypto grow it, yeah definitely so yeah uh, moving on we're going to talk about a story from pedro here which what do you want to start with pedro just go ahead oh sure i'll start with um What's going on in uh, Austrian post offices? So um, in an article at ETH News, buying cryptocurrencies from Bitpanda in Aus- Austrian post offices. On July 11th, a Vienna-based startup firm, Bitpanda, published a press release announcing its new partnership with Austria's po- postal service. bitpanda to go now facilitates the exchange of euros for cryptocurrencies in post offices all over Aus- Austria. As per their release, quote, an account with a valid email address is all you need. You select the chosen digital currency such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dash, or Litecoin, and after entering the code, within seconds, the amount of your chosen currency will be transferred into your wallet. Wow. So Bitpanda uh, at the post office. That's, I don't know if I'd ever expect that in the United States. In Austria. Right. I, I, it's, 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 People still mail letters? I guess. Well... Um, I, I mean, sure, sure. I, well, I imagine I mean, they well, still do. This is a nice distributing point, right? If if all the post office have it, you're like, oh, I need some crypto. Well, I'll just go to the post office, right? Yeah. Everybody knows where the post office is, whether you send letters or don't. Yeah, I, I can get some uh, stamps and some so, crypto. <laughs> and, and and let's face it, when when you when you do something at the post office, there's this, um, you know, there's this basic, you know, hidden in the room of wow, the you know the government or big, you know powers that be are they must be okay because it's happening at a post office they wouldn't let anything crazy go at a post office so it, it could be a reassuring way for people that are new to crypto to say you know that this is a good way to get into it because it, it's at my local post office so it, it's got to be you know vetted out and shaken well you know so. what that sounds like a brilliant plan for the united states post offices to follow i mean if yeah. they're losing money selling letters yeah they might as well sell crypto right i mean th- so makes money they partnered with bitpanda which i'm assuming they're going to get some of the profits of this exchange right I, i'd hope so right so how about we turn all of the United States post offices into crypto distributors into, into as well? Big Bitcoin teller machines. Well, maybe not just Bitcoin. <laughs> oh well, yeah, that's right. Dash teller machines. What am I talking about? <laughs> DTMs. We need we need DTMs all over the place. Actually, I, I saw an article about uh, a couple in Florida that were uh, dash dash. Yeah, there was uh, eight uh, that yep. were converted over, and now, now I believe that number is nine. There wow. was a ninth one already converted over. And so, yeah, it, it, I mean, it's growing. It's growing. I mean, well, with, with the troubles, if you're a listener to Neocast Radio, you know about the troubles of Bitcoin. If you're a Bitcoin user, you certainly know about the troubles of Bitcoin. Yes. And I mean, there's been kind of a reprieve lately in the network because there's less transactions. But the reason why there's less transactions is be- because people don't want to use it. Well, because it's going, something's going to change with it. 
Yeah, I mean, well, and, and people are scared. I mean, people too. are people are basically I'm scared preparing too. for whatever change is going to happen with the UA, yeah, the USA, I, I, whatever the, the forks, the forks, their forks. They're going to fork it, okay? Yeah, and they they've talked about they, forking. They've the gone fork. and forked Bitcoin. <laughs> well, yeah, well, it hasn't happened yet, but well, yes, in, August first, I think it's yes. slated to. To actually do that, and sure, it's, it's going to be a pain in a lot of people's rear. My rear, well, rear the, specifically. imagine all the wallets out there. Okay, now, yes. all these wallets, are, the, if they haven't planned ahead, or if they don't even know it's going to happen, right? Because some of the code changes that they've been implementing. I mean, I've seen posts from Luke Jr. talking about how they're going to drastically lower the mining difficulty when this clicks, clicks yeah. over. And also, I think of that same post, he was going to change the proof of work algorithm too. Yeah. So all the ASICs won't work on the new. Bitcoin and uh, and so th- those are just going to stay on the old one, I guess. Yeah, I, I that's th- that's what I'm seeing now, and, and it's just and you know the the changes that are coming through week by week. Who knows what is actually going to happen on August first? I, w- I would have hoped that by now, calmer heads would have prevailed and and come out with a way so that that possibility is not likely. No, it's it's it's. It's either you know, and Luke Jr. and and the cronies like I don't I don't like you. And I'm making it very clear. Obviously, you're hearing new cash rate if you listen, which I doubt you do. But I'm, I'm guessing your mission was either to take over Bitcoin or or kill it. Okay, that's what I'm guessing your mission was because you are definitely succeeding on one or both of those. I honestly think Luke Jr. is just confused because he's been. If, I don't think you can't be confused this long, this hard. I don't. I, I don't agree with well, that. Well, well, that's fine. But I'm basing sure. I, I mean, you're. Yeah, we can have whatever opinion we want, but yeah. uh, the, the the I mean, I know Luke has been very involved in the Bitcoin project very early. Uh, I mean, so ever since I got on it, got in on it, which was like 2011, that's pretty early. Uh, Luke was there. Yeah, and so I, you know, if he's an actor that's trying to infiltrate, um, he he's done a good job of being there very early, which is something. No, I, I he, unusual. No, no, look at people change, man. But uh, Someone, but he, Luke has yeah. not changed. He's been weird since since 2011. Since I've seen him online. Okay. So uh, he he's been weird like that. There's uh, rumors around that he's a flat earther and all the kinds of weird things. Um, but uh, I mean, I I, I mean, there's that. There's well, that. okay, okay. Then, then let's take a step back and let let's take a step back and and just ask ourselves what sort of core, what sort of team has these sort of problems. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, if you look at any sort of business that, that does something and creates a product or provides almost a service... Almost every project, almost every business has these problems. The, the big difference between a business is if they have these problems, they can fire That's the right. person. That's right. And, <laughs> and with uh, Bitcoin, you can't fire the person because they're a volunteer. There's just no way to do that. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I do believe he is on Blockstream's payroll, so B- Blockstream could fire him, but not the. there's no way the development team can. Wow. Well, hmm. well, let's move on and talk about um, the other things completely. So we're going to explore for the first time the Internet of Things IOTA. And I know if you've been tracking coins on the, your favorite coin market cap or uh, coin cap or whatever you're watching, you notice that it's in the top 10 or so. Well, I don't even know what it is. So a, an email, we got an email from a listener who requested I look at this this coin. So I did. Here it goes. Billing itself as the cryptocurrency for the Internet of Things industry, the IOTA is a blockchainless, fee-less cryptocurrency. Rather, it, rather than a distributed ledger, IOTA resolves transaction states to a DAG or a dynamic a, a cyclic graph. They call it a tangle or tangle graph. What they have done, uh, they have done away with the monetary fee and replaced it with a work requirement. So each user would operate a node or through a node. This is similar to running the Bitcoin QT client. The client software with the Bitcoin QT is actively receiving, validating, and rebroadcasting, in some sense, the data to other nodes that may not have received it yet and miners that are yet to include it into a block. With IOTA, the to issue a transaction, nodes must work to approve two other transactions. This includes some cryptographic hashing and nonce guessing, but nowhere near the intensity of Bitcoin mining. The transactions your node selects to approve are based on a few different factors, but it basically boils down to these two transactions don't conflict, I will approve them. From their white paper, it's important to note a few things. The IOTA tangle is asynchronous, and some nodes will see different transactions. The tangle may contain conflicting transactions. 
Uh, number three, the nodes do not have to reach consensus on which transaction issued by the protocol have the right to be in the tangle. And uh, because the transactions are interlinked through this approval process, they can be assigned a variety of metrics. The height, depth, and weight of a transaction are cal calculated and used to establish the longest chains. Uh, the white paper is full of formulas and even gives some space to predicting attack vectors and then explaining how the protocol can deal with them. From what I gather, the idea is that an IoT device will run a node on board and as it needs to interact with the Tangle, it will approve two other transactions by issuing its own. As I scale that out to perhaps one or more devices in each house, that starts to become a massive network. After some thought, my biggest concern is not necessarily the protocol, but the devices themselves. The history of IoT devices has given us botnets and breaches due to terrible manufacturing practices in the first place. Selling a million internet devices all with the same password is trouble. Currently, there are more than 15.4 billion devices connected to the internet, and predictions put that number at 38 billion by 2020 and more than 70 billion units by 2025. Many of these devices have either been developed with weak security protocols or suffer from poor user diligence. As far as innovative protocols go, the IoTA tangle is fascinating, and I look forward to see what happens next. So that's my report on IoTA. Um, Color now, me skeptical. You, <laughs> that, <laughs> Darren, you, you, we should just like make that your your little tag. <laughs> that should be my tag. Line. Darren, color I mean, me skeptical. These things come out so quick; it's, it's so hard to verify them all. But one reason I'm not trying to verify it, this thing is because I don't have any Internet of Things in my house. You don't? Yes. Do you like a I smart? Don't. I think a smartphone. I have is a smartphone, but it's not. I don't. Think it's no. A, okay, so it's not it's not an Internet of Things appliance per yes, se. Yes, yes. I don't have a smart toaster. I don't have a smart refrigerator. I don't have a smart. I mean, eventually, I think these things will exist. Now, what I don't, I don't know that the, I'm. You don't have an Amazon Echo. Things. No, I don't. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, neither do I. I mean, they, I don't like the idea of being listened to all the time and all, all that. I mean, I know my phone kind of does that, but. Well, anyway, it's just it's it seems like a good idea to solve the problem of, let's say, your devices don't have solid state drives that are like four terabytes big and you can't put a blockchain on them, things like that. And it's interesting to note uh, how all of this sort of tangles together. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm interested to see if the tangle thing works out, if, if, if uh, you don't have consensus, but yet it's still working. Is, uh, that would be very interesting to me. I'd be interested to just read about that and learn about it. Yeah, but uh, I mean, I, I still, I still am big fan of this Nakamoto consensus. Yeah, yeah. it seems to be doing pretty good. Well, Pedro, you got another story for us. Sure, uh, Congressional Blockchain Education Day. Nice. So, members of Congress meet with representatives from several leading blockchain industry companies on July 11th. The Chamber of Digital Commerce hosted the Congressional Blockchain Education Day. The world's largest blockchain trade association sought to promote the benefits of the relatively new technology to members of the House and Senate. Working alongside representatives from over 70 chamber member companies, blockchain advocates spent the working day on Capitol Hill enlightening lawmakers about the technology underpinning a global digital currency awakening. Quote, we are delighted that so many of the chamber's members are flying into Washington, D.C. to meet with and help educate our legislatures and their staff on this breakthrough and potentially multi trillion dollar in technology. We're honored to, that participants have the opportunity to hear directly from members of the Congressional Blockchain Caucus. Wow. Well, so, um, I, I mean... It needs to happen. Yeah, it, 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 it kind of needs to... It's good to have um, people not want to destroy what you're interested in, and if that is what this accomplishes, then I think it's a good thing. Yeah. Well, I, you know, it's just we we still have requests from people to come up with that video series or that post with videos. Now, of course, Randy and I did the decrypting Bitcoin one, but of course, there are, there are shorter ones out there that are maybe more concise about what you're looking for. Um, but the educational aspects of this just maybe it's we're immune to it because we've been in it for so long and, and we pay it so close attention to it. But a lot of people that are just coming into the scene there's just it's overwhelming all the different things and words and terminology and techniques that you're you're exposed to uh, absolutely i mean i i have you know a fair number of friends that are it professionals they are very, you know they're in corporations they do big data centers storage networking really smart people and 
you know, they kind of hear about crypto and, and they try to keep up with it, but it, it's difficult. Um, and it, it's not from a lack of, of trying. It's just there's a lot going on. I remember this time last year, I mean, it was very easy to stay on top of, of news, right, JJ? Yeah. But now, you know, even us, we're, you know, we're always on every day trying to just stay stay up on what's happening uh, in the whole ecosystem. It's really speeding up. Yes. Well, moving on to talk about some other things, and we're, we're sort of bringing it back to our show and our personal experiences a little bit here. But just this week, I uh, so th- there's a, a miner running here, and, and we've been mining Ethereum with it, and that's been a great experiment. It's been fun to learn that. And I recently switched it to Zcash because the difficulty with Ethereum, and and they're both really difficult right now, where it's it's getting to the point with that, that difficulty bomb of Ethereum really needs to start moving into... You know, this is this is Casper. Yeah. Let's start rolling it down to the test nets and things like that. Yeah. So, um, so that's that's sort of like. Do you still do any mining, Pedro? Or are you sort of done with that for now? Uh, I'm done with that for now. I'm in the process of a, of a move, uh, so I got a lot of other things going on. But um, for sure, when the weather gets cold up here in New Hampshire and we're inside more. Uh, my interest in mining starts to to go back up. <laughs> to heat up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've actually talked about moving it down to the basement to, to heat our, our room down here. In the winter, you might as well. Well, here's the problem with that. And and you, from a logistical standpoint, you look at, oh, okay, I'm going to move a miner into my living space, and then I'm just going to let it heat up the area. Well, let me tell you, those fans, even Loud. just on the cards, not even your fan that moves the air around the room, the fans on the cards are going at 100% all day. And it is a whiny horrible screechy noise that you don't you you can't really get away with right and, and you're doing what five cards five the, cards right? yeah uh, and then you see pictures of people that you know have like you know 30 cards and and it's in their living space i i don't know how they could do it no well moving on to talk about neocache radio more specifically we are working to incorporate a uh, spanish language uh conversion of our shows on the blog and so we've got uh, one of our friends our local friends here is uh, willing to help us out with that. And uh, he takes crypto, which, <laughs> that's, that's good news. Imagine that. So we are really looking to uh, branch out a little bit more in the language area starting out and making this show more accessible for people around the globe. Because let's face it, English, while popular, is not the only language spoken around the world. And so if you are out there and you're interested in uh, you know uh, maybe translating it into a language we don't have and currently we only have English and we'll have Spanish soon but uh, make a case for it send me an email at jj at neocashradio.com and we are yes there yeah Tongwen uh, we, we, we want them to do Chinese right well yeah Chinese yes yeah. we yeah. do want Chinese um, Russian. Uh, I mean, basically... Well, yeah, Chinese is a billion, over a billion people. Yeah, well, I, okay, sure. Yeah, we sure. got we to gotta go for, you know, I, I think numbers and also market potential. You know, uh, you know, now crypto is really starting to get a lot of attention in India, and that's a, that's a huge population yeah. that could... And, and an ideal population that could, you know, be turned on to crypto because of uh, just access to uh, their funds with uh, simple electronic means and not having to travel to go to a, a traditional bank. Yeah, it totally is. And so, like, that's, I mean, that's important to, to me and I, I think to us for, for really getting the message out there. I mean, the show is really about spreading the information, the ideas, and a lot of the security risks associated with this because we are, quite frank, about the dangers. Yeah. And we start out with the security risk of uh, Verizon, but what, what cryptocurrency kind of does is, is it removes uh, your trust in these third parties to trust with your information, which clearly sometimes they're not. And uh, yeah. so you, it removes that trust, but at the same time, it places the responsibility on the person using the cryptocurrency. That's right. And I mean, uh, I'm, I know that a lot of these cryptocurrency people are trying to set it up where it's unlikely that something bad will happen. It's impossible to set it up where you can be certain that nothing bad will yeah, happen. Yeah, just one fat finger and you accidentally sent your your, your coin to the wrong address. Yeah, you I, know, I did that early days. I accidentally sent Bitcoin twice. And, uh, the, the, you know, everybody was real friendly back then. So that I, I, to, I was trying to buy coffee. So I emailed the people and said, hey, would you send me extra coffee or would you p- give me back the Bitcoin to this address? They totally gave me that, back the Bitcoin. It was nice. Well, and, and one final, final wrap up. So as the, we are trying to, Darren and I have been doing this show for a while. And for a while, it was just a cruise, right? It was on autopilot and we just did it every week. Yep. And it was just what it, it was just Wednesday and that was it. 
But now the show well, has... It was just Sunday. Or when, when it was Sunday, Sunday. that's right. Yeah, it was we Sunday for Sunday. the longest time. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and, and now things are really heating up. We're, getting, uh, we're approaching around 20,000 downloads a month. With the show, and, and there's more for uh, YouTube views, and then there's, I think, a couple, I know, I know there's a couple terrestrial radios, uh, pirate, two pirate stations, and then one that's not really a pirate station, but, so, you know, there's a bunch of different places that are uh, heating up for Neocache Radio, and we're definitely looking to grow the show and build it into an international uh, crypto and monetary news show, so... And we're looking for people with ideas and interest in helping, and you can help out by simply sharing the show. That's all you have to do. Yeah, share it, and um, yeah, and, and we can. Well, if you tip us, we can turn that around and you know buy the labor to to, to do to get some of these things done. That's so. right. In fact, today we have our social media um, helper starting out, and so you'll probably notice more Facebook. And Twitter posts on a consistent basis. And you can retweet all of those. That's right. Retweet all the things. So we'll have uh, a, a, g- a gentleman helping us translate to Spanish. And we also have a, a gentleman helping us right now in the studio with us. Uh, is it, He's helping us with the blog. He's not actually on the show or anything, but he's going to help us get the blog up quick so we can turn the show around rather fast and get it out to you as soon as possible. So there's a lot happening with Neocache Radio. And, of course, we are pursuing advertisers because we want to take that money and we want to make this this stuff happen faster and hire more people and and get more neocash in more ears so if you're interested in that please contact us and we'll be happy to hear you out and and if it doesn't fit you know i wish you the best if it does fit well then we'll we'll find some negotiations and and make it work but anyway uh just want to give you an update on the show where we're at and how things are going for Neocash Radio, this is JJ, Darren, Pedro, Neocash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. Neocashradio.com. Radio.